So uh, this is lecture 21 on applications of the mean value theorem. And let's get right into it. So this is section 4.3 in, in your text. Um, and so here's our first proposition. Let f be continuous on the closed interval a to b and differentiable on the open interval a to b if f prime of x is equal to 0 for all x um, in a to b, then f is constant on a b, right? Um, and so the proof is by contradiction as it turns out. So suppose by contradiction the f is not constant on a b, then there exist a1 and b1 such that, you know, without loss of generality, a1 is less than b1, right? And of course a is below a1 and b is above b1 because by assumption they're in that closed interval, right? And um, also we're assuming that f of a1 is not equal to f of b1, right, towards the contradiction. But then, by the mean value theorem, there exists a constant such that the average rate of change from b1 to a1 is equal to uh, f prime of c for some c between a1 and b1, right? And then, of course, this by construction is not equal to zero, and on the other hand, f prime of uh, x is equal to zero for every x in a to b, which of course c would be in there, right? So that's a contradiction. All right. Um, so, let's see here. Um, I mean, yeah, fine. I um, I suspect there are other ways of proving this. Um, but this is not bad, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, now, the next thing, uh, of course, is to connect the um, positive or negative derivatives with increasing and decreasing, right? So here's how that goes. If the derivative is positive for all x in the open interval, then f is strictly increasing on that open interval. Likewise, if the derivative is negative, then um, f is strictly decreasing. Um, I should point out, like, the converse of this isn't quite true, right? Because, like, to see that the converse direction is not true, think about this, f of x equal to x cubed on minus 1 to 1, right? Notice that f prime of x is what? It's 3x squared, and of course f prime of 0 is equal to 0, and yet you can easily see that the cubic from, you know, minus 1 to 1, um, because I should make these open circles, right? The, the, the cubic from minus 1 to 1 is, in fact, um, strictly increasing. And yet, there's a place where the derivative is 0, right? So the converse to this proposition is not, is not true. Um, not, a, not at least without adding some, some further bells and whistles, let's say. Now, um, so here's the proof. Fix any x1 and x2 and a, b such that x1 is less than x2. Then by the mean value theorem, there exists a constant between x1 and x2, such that the <clears throat> average rate of change from x1 to x2 is equal to the instantaneous rate of change at c. Like so, right? And that's positive. But the thing is, x2 minus x1 is positive, which means that f of 2 minus f of x1 also must be, must be positive, right? So, and if f of x2 minus f of x1 is positive, that means that, I'll write it down, f of x2, this implies f of x2 minus f of x1 is greater than zero. <clears throat> and then that gives you that f of x1 is smaller than f of x2, right? Consequently, f is strictly increasing on a, b, and the proof of uh, proof of 2 is exactly the same, except instead of having greater than, you've got less than, which flips the things around. So it gives you strictly decreasing instead. So that's very cool. Um, of course, we've all been aware of this connection between the positivity or negativity of the derivative and increasing and decrease since we took calculus 1, but it's nice to see the proof of that like that. Now, of course, one simple application of that previous proposition is just to look at the power function right, f of x equal x to the n, the derivative is n times x to the n minus 1, so um, certainly if we're taking uh, non-negative input from 0 to infinity, then this is, um, 
well, it's only zero if x is equal to zero, so right? So if we look at from po if we look at positive x from zero to infinity, um, then f prime of x is, is is greater than zero there, right? And so consequently, f is strictly increasing from zero to infinity um, for this power function, right? And um, as your textbook says here, in particular, this shows every positive real number has exactly one nth root. Um, and we'll get back to that at the end of this section here, so I'm going to go on here. Next up, the inverse function theorem. And the inverse function theorem is uh, one of the central results of, uh, you know, calculus, and um, maybe the calculus of functions, I would say. Um, I don't know. Anyway, um, here it is in one dimension. Now, this theorem actually... Um, it has a corresponding version for functions from, say, Rn to Rn, or you may, might say maps. And we'll talk about that in a future lecture here. But uh, for now, let's do the one-dimensional version. f is differentiable on the open interval a to b, and um, f prime of x non-zero for all x and a, b. Then f is 1 to 1. f of i is an open interval. And the inverse function from f of i to i is a differentiable function. And Indeed, the derivative is given by the reciprocal of the derivative of the original function. Notice that this is at y and this is at x, and this is actually f of x is equal to y. So you um, you could write this as 1 over, if you wanted to write it in terms of y, you could write it this way. This is f prime evaluated put my one over here, at f inverse of, of y. Right. But, of course, they didn't want to write that, because that looks ugly. And it's <laughs> nicer to hide the um, what's going on with just using two different letters and a little comment after the formula, isn't it? <laughs> so, but there is what it is. The... Um, derivative of the inverse is related to the derivative of the original function, but not at exactly the same, at corresponding point, all right? All right, so here goes. Um, first of all, I should point out, if f is differentiable, right, then um, it's differentiable and its um, derivative, if differentiable and non-zero for every, huh. Oh, okay, so let me reason through it with you. If this is non-zero, it means it can't be... Um, that means it has to always be positive or always be negative, right? Because um, if it's if it's zero at one point, it's zero at nearby points as well. Well, that's not necessary to say. Uh, I don't need to say that. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm getting continuous differentiability in my brain, but uh, forget that. Simply this, if 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 the derivative is non-zero for every x, then that means it's either positive or it's negative, uh, you know, on this open interval. So if it's positive, we have differential function, positive derivative, open interval. By the previous result in this section, we know that it's strictly increasing, right? On the other hand, if the derivative is negative, um, then that means the function is strictly decreasing on the open interval. In a previous section, we've shown that, you know, f increasing implies that f of a, b is f of a, comma, f of b, right? And f decreasing would imply that f of a, comma, b is f of, um, f of b, comma, f of a, right, if it's, if it's, um, if it is decreasing, it's biggest at a and it's smallest at b, right, yeah. So that was in a previous section, in a, in a, in a paragraph, but that's the result, and so that, that would show you that, um, you know, well, well, first of all, if it's strictly increasing, that implies one-to-one, -one. and, um, the fact that f of i is an open interval is from, this result from the previous a previous section back, I think, in chapter 3, section 4. But of course, it still remains to show that the inverse function is differentiable, so let's look at how that goes. 
Um, so proof, so he's just basically saying, okay, so either that's, I'll just, he's just saying what I just said. It's either positive or it's negative, right? And if it's positive, then it's increasing. And so it follows that it's one to one and that f of i is the open interval, as I showed. And um, vice versa, if it was negative, same song and dance. So, in other words, we get that um, f of i is an open interval and also f inverse is continuous on f of i. Now that, I don't remember. Uh, oh, goodness gracious. Hmm, I guess that must be the remark 3.411. Uh, he says, in this case we can show using the intermediate value theorem that f of a comma b is c infinity and proceed as above, f is continuous and inverse. Well, I don't know, he's discussing things about rays and uh, versus bounded functions. It's back on page um, 82, I guess. 82. Hmm. Well, anyway, I'm going to move on here. So, I don't know if we actually needed that f inverse is continuous on f of i. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat, I, I don't know, like, f inverse is continuous on f of i, like, I get that for free once I show that, um, f is, f, f inverse is differentiable, um, on f of i, and that's what we're about to prove, so let's just, let's just go with that, right, we don't need to, we don't need a separate proof that f inverse is continuous, because we're going to prove it's differentiable, and differentiable implies continuous anyway, so let's, let's stick with that. All right. Sorry, I don't have a complete recall of everything in the book up to this point, and, um, oh well. Uh, anyway, here, so, um, he says, fix y bar in the image of f with y bar equal to f of x bar and let g be the inverse function. We know that the inverse function exists because in either case, positive or negative derivative, we have that the function's either increasing or decreasing, which then implies um, that it's injective. All right. Um, it's one to one. And if it's one to one, then set theory says you can construct the inverse um, with the appropriate choice of, uh, you know, domain, namely the range, and, um, okay, anyway, so here we go, let g be f inverse, we want to show that the limit as y goes to y bar of g of y minus g of y bar over y minus y bar is equal to 1 over the derivative of the original function at x bar, because notice that x bar here is f inverse of y bar, in my way of thinking. Anyway, so he says, okay, so fix a sequence yk in the image that converges to y bar, and yet it's not equal to y bar for every k. And then, um, of course, there's a corresponding sequence in the domain such that f of xk is equal to yk, right? In other words, g of yk equals to, um, so g of yk is saying that, so here it is, f of xk equal to yk implies xk equals to f inverse of yk, but of course that is in his notation, or their notation, g of yk, right? Um, but, um, okay, so, oh, I see why. <laughs> so we needed the continuity of the inverse for the proof that the derivative exists. That's kind of funny. We need it right here, so, um, as he says, from the continuity of g, we get that xk converges to x-bar, right? So, um, so by continuity of g, as k goes to infinity, g of yk goes to g of y-bar, and g of y-bar is x-bar, so which means xk goes to x-bar. Um, yeah, fine. Fine, 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 we need... We need the continuity, the inverse, because of that. I, I, I see it, I see it. Um, where was I? <clears throat> then, if you look at the difference quotient for g, then we can 
of course, g of yk is xk, and g of y bar is x bar. And so we get xk minus x bar over f of xk minus f of x bar, and then, you know, by the uh, reciprocal, like the usual laws of algebra, we can bring the one x minus xk minus x bar upstairs to one over xk minus x bar downstairs, and in so doing, we get the difference quotient for f, and as k goes to infinity, that goes to f prime of x bar by the differentiability, um, assumed differentiability of f. Which then, of course, since we've shown the sequential limit of the difference quotient exists and is equal to f prime of x bar um, reciprocated, it follows then that the um, the limit in the usual sense of, of uh, g um, as y goes to y bar um, of g of y minus g of y bar over y minus y bar exists and is equal to that using the, the uh, transference theorem from sequential to um, continuous limits that we had from that previous chapter. And so that completes the proof and shows that the derivative exists and of course that then and, and the value is reciprocal like that. Of course, just a, a friendly reminder, if you know, um, there's another way of seeing that and then this is very easy to see, but um, there's a big assumption here, which is that you know the derivatives. Um, you know that the derivative of the inverse function exists, right? And um, so you could look at it this way, right? So f composed with g um, equals the what? Um, well, the identity function, I suppose on what? On the um, image of, I suppose, uh, f of i and g composed with f is the identity function on i in this context. But anyway, so g of f of x is equal to x for all x in i, right? And of course the chain rule says what? It says g prime of f of x times f prime of x equals to, well, dx dx, which is what? Well, dx dx, of course, is 1. And so this shows you that g prime of f of x is equal to 1 over f prime of x. Right? And this one here, you could have looked at as f composed with g of y. That was supposed to be a g equals to y again, right? And if you differentiate that, you get f prime of g of y times g prime of y equals to 1 again. I'm differentiating with respect to y, which once more shows you that g prime of y is equal to 1 over. So however you want to slice it, it's easy enough to derive the relation between the derivative and the um, of the function and the derivative of the inverse um, if you know if you know it exists, then you can just use a chain rule to derive it. You know, it's not a big deal. <clears throat> Another thing to notice, and this is, um, I think, worth pointing out, and something we should emphasize more in calculus. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I don't know. Um, which is that if a function is invertible and it's 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 increasing, then it's it's uh, it's um, its inverse is also increasing. And um, also, if the function's decreasing, then its inverse is also decreasing. That has to, um, at corresponding points, of course, that has to be the case since the product of the derivative of the inverse and the derivative of the function is equal to 1. It must be that they share the same sign, um, either plus plus or minus minus, um, which shows you that, you know, increase and or, and or decrease is shared by the function and its inverse at appropriate um, values of the domain and the range for the original function. Um, it actually is an important thing to know about as you're looking for derivatives of like the inverse sine and cosine functions in Calc 1. But anyway. And then one last um, neat little argument here. This example, he says, okay, so we've got the power function. It's differentiable. It's got a non-zero derivative on zero to infinity. And um, we can also see that the image of zero to infinity is zero to infinity. So by the inverse function theorem, the inverse, which goes from 0 infinity to 0 infinity, is differentiable. And the derivative of the inverse is like so, right? And um, so what this means is that 
since the derivative is positive, because the function was also increasing, right, so the derivative is also increasing, it follows then that the inverse function here is, 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 um, is increasing, and what that also means is that if you calculate f inverse of a particular number y, that only happens, that, that has a single output, right, um, and that is the nth root, which we denote by the nth root of y. So calculus allows us to um, verify that there is a unique positive nth root, and it's pretty easy to do, um, like I've shown you here. But, well, I don't know if I showed you. I indicated where in the book you can study to understand it more carefully. All right, so next up, I think we're looking at uh, Taylor's theorem, so I'll try to get to that next.